Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. And then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This was the wor word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. My plan this morning is to start in a dark place and then lighten the mood by talking about stewardship. Part of the face of Christianity this week came to us from Word of Life Christian Church in New Hartford, New, New York, where two teenagers were beaten, one of them to death, in an effort to get them to confess their sins and seek forgiveness. Now we want to be clear here that what happened there has nothing to do with the forgiveness that Tom Church talked about last Sunday. It probably has as it, at its root lots of things. But it seems to me that it's arrogance bordering on hubris to believe that you essentially are God. And Lamont has a great saying, great line. It says, if your God hates all of the people that you hate, then you can be pretty sure that you've made God in your image. Next week, we'll celebrate Heritage Sunday. And I don't know the liturgy for next week, but in the last several years we've done this service, we have used as our confession of faith, or our affirmation of faith, rather, the first chapter of the Scots Confession. And it's a wonderful piece that talks about God, describes God as omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, and then it's got an amazing word in there, a surprising word. It says, God is incomprehensible. Sometimes we think we've got God by the tail, but God is a mystery and we're never fully going to know God. Shirley Guthrie's a professor of theology at, or was a professor of theology at Columbia Theological Seminary, a Presbyterian seminary in Decatur, Georgia wrote a book called Christian Doctrine. And in this book, he describes 18 different doctrines of the church. We don't have time for 18 different doctrines this morning, so I'm gonna do it in three words. Love, freedom, and discipleship. Love. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. In the beginning, God created and he saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. As I paraphrase it, he loved it. God so loved the world. God sent his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but would have life everlasting. Karl Barth, prominent 20th century theologian upon his retirement, 
was asked what was the greatest lesson he had learned in all of his years of studying the Bible. And he is reported to have said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And back to Shirley Guthrie. God does not say, I will love you if you are good. If you prove yourself worthy, if you do so and so, if you first love me. No, God simply says, I love you. God is the initiator. God is the creator, the first actor. There is nothing that you can do to earn God's love. And Paul writes to the church at Rome saying, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Love. Freedom. I've had the opportunity, not just in this church, but in some of the work I've done with the Presbytery and with the Synod of Mid-America, to be involved in the process of searching and examining candidates for positions within the church, ordained candidates. And it seems to me that we should always ask the question, what does it mean to claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And it is amazing the frequency with, work, with which the answer comes back, freedom. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word and are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And even in Revelation, in him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And Jesus, talking to his disciples in John, says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Shannon Kirshner, the pastor of Fourth Church in Chicago, speak, speaking about Martin Luther and his struggle to come to grips with what he needed to do to earn salvation. The winds of God's Spirit moving through the words of Scripture revealed to Luther that what he could not do for himself, God had already done for him in Jesus Christ. And this overwhelming sense of grace and deep knowledge that by no act or merit of his own, he had already been made right by God in Jesus Christ. And that honestly set Luther free. What is this freedom? It's freedom from fears, freedom from guilt, freedom from law, freedom from death, freedom from having to earn our own salvation. Whatever it is that oppresses you, that binds you, that holds you captive, that keeps you from living a full, loving relationship with God, whatever keeps you from living an abundant life. Freedom. And finally, discipleship. Discipleship is our response to this love and this freedom. It's a joyous response. It's not an obligation. It's not a duty. We're compelled, but not in the sense that we have to, but in the sense that we can't help ourselves. And the order is critical. Love, freedom, and discipleship. It doesn't run both ways. It's not discipleship and then freedom and then love. But much of 21st century Christianity makes that mistake. We want to establish a bunch of rules. This is what you need to do to earn this love and this freedom. I have it on no less of authority than Facebook, which told me just, it was yesterday or today, my sister-in-law posted a, a picture, a little poster, that said, religion says, God will love us if we change. 
The gospel says God's love will change us. Faith is the realization of the grace that is offered through Jesus Christ. Luther also quickly realized his response to this freedom mattered, for he realized that he was free from the exhaustion of earning his own salvation in order to be free for faithful living. We are free to act, free to love. It's a corollary of the first love, the love that God has for us. The greatest gift that God has given us is the opportunity that we have to love or not to love. Jesus being asked, what is the greatest commandment said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so we come to our story of Ananias and Sapphira. In the early church for a time, they engaged in communal living, everything was pooled together. Ananias and his wife hold back some of the proceeds for themselves. I warned Brent that I was going to use this scripture. So don't go running to him telling him, he said, if we don't raise the budget, we're all going to die. <laughs> That's not the message in the commentary to the Life Application Bible. You may not be familiar with the Life Application Bible, but for a number of years it was the Bible we gave to confirmands on their Confirmation Sunday. And it says this about the story of Ananias and Sapphira. The sin of Ananias and Sapphira was not stinginess or holding back part of the money. It was their choice whether or not to sell the land and how much to give. The sin was lying to God, saying they gave the whole amount but holding back some for themselves and trying to make themselves appear more generous than they really were. Arrogance. What is the antidote to arrogance? It came to me just within the last few weeks. I came across a prayer by Thomas Merton. Thomas Burton was a Trappist monk known for his contemplative lifestyle and his writing on contemplative prayer. And this is the prayer that I came across. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following you, you're following your will, does not mean that I am actually doing so. And this is the critical line. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right hand road, although I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. In our gospel lesson, Jesus is approached by Pharisees with a plan to trick him. And we know it's an important story because this story appears in Matthew and Mark and Luke and it's virtually identical in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. They have devised what I call a nuanced question. It doesn't matter how Jesus answers the question, they're gonna, he's going to get in trouble. Jesus says, and I like the words of the Revised Standard Version because that's what I grew up with, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. 
Now, some scholars read the nuanced question and they see a nuanced answer. And they talk about being dual citizens, citizens of God and citizens of Caesar. And I think it's not a nuanced answer. It's a nuanced question, it's a trick. They're trying to entrap Jesus, and I think he gives them a sledgehammer answer. And the answer is it all belongs to God. You should not worry about the claim the church in its stewardship, stewardship campaign makes on your money. The important thing is the claim that Christ makes on your life, all of it. The goal of the stewardship campaign is never about the money. The goal of the stewardship campaign is to move each of us closer to a faithfulness to God, truly claiming Christ as Lord and Savior. If we don't raise the budget, it has real consequences. I don't deny that. Let me give you a couple of simple examples. Several years ago, I heard a pitch for the one great hour of sharing, an offering we take right before Easter. And I probably didn't hear it right, or maybe the person giving it got the decimal point in the wrong place, but what I heard was, in order to feed all of the hungry people in the world, it would take $17 trillion a day. But even if the math isn't right, what I took from it was right. The number is overwhelming. It seems unimaginable that it could be accomplished. And with five loaves and two fish, Jesus fed 5,000 people. And I'm reminded of the time in the temple when Jesus is gathered with his disciples and the widow comes in and puts her mite in the collection plate, the least coin of the realm. And that was the contribution that was treasured most. Many of you here are familiar with the power of the least coin. The second example is a number of years ago, and this has been a number of years ago, I was given the opportunity to serve on our church's committee for the Bicentennial Fund, or it could have been the Major Mission Fund, I don't remember. I know it was a long time ago because Ed Brubaker was the pastor, and that's five pastors ago. I also know it was a long time ago because I was the young married person representative on the committee. We had raised our church budget. We had given the Pentecost offering, the Peace and Global Witness offering, the Christmas Joy offering, the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. And the session had agreed to raise an additional quarter of a million dollars for this fund that was going to fund mission of the Presbyterian Church all around the world, raising hundreds of millions of dollars. The first time we gathered as a committee, one of the older members of the committee, a long-standing member of this church, said, what we need to do is we need to gather together 15 or 20 families, we know who they are, have a dinner, and tell them how much we need. And we can raise the money. And the decision of the committee was that was not what we should do. Everybody needed the opportunity to participate in this mission. We probably could have raised a quarter of a million dollars that way, I don't know. But we did raise a quarter of a million dollars and we did it by involving everybody and giving them the opportunity to participate in that mission endeavor. In our church budget, what we are saying is this is how we are going to meet our responsibility for the great ends of the church, for the proclamation of the gospel, the shelter, nurture, and fellowship of the children of God 
And the children of God are not just the ones who come up front for the time with the children. For the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. For me, it starts with render unto God that which is God's. That's where we start with our understanding of stewardship. It all belongs to God, all of our time, our talent, and our treasure. And I close by turning to Moses. Deuteronomy is made up principally of three sermons. It's kind of Moses' last shot at the people before they go into the promised land, and Moses is not going with them. And he's reminded them of a number of things. And this is what, part of what Moses says in that second sermon. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God. When you have eaten your fill and have built fine houses and live in them, when your herds and flocks have multiplied and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then do not exalt yourself, forgetting the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery, who led you through great and terrible wilderness and arid wasteland with poisonous snakes and scorpions. He made water flow for you from flint rock and fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your ancestors did not know, to humble you and to test you, and in the end, to do you good. Do not say to yourself, my power and my might of my own hand have gotten me this wealth. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, so that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your ancestors, as is he is doing today. In response to God's grace and with gratitude for the love and freedom which is yours, we are called and challenged to render unto God that which is God's. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As you are able, please stand and let us all join together affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.